Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're continuing our series on reparenting as part of the process of healing from complex trauma, learning to take care of my own needs, learning to handle situations that I encounter. And today I want to talk about one of the scenarios that a parent would have as they are training their child, getting them ready for adulthood, is that they would prepare them when they go into a new situation. And so sometimes if you think of a child going off to university or a child that's going to go and get a job, let's say in a construction firm, the parent would hopefully sit them down and say, I'm excited you're going off to university or got this job, but I want you to be aware that you're gonna face some temptations when you go into that. You're gonna face some pressure to do certain things that might not be healthy. And so the, ch- the parent would make the child aware of potential forces they're going to have to deal with, temptations they're going to have to deal with. And this is, becomes an important part of parenting. And so what I want to talk about today is, as we reparent ourselves, we have to be aware of forces that we're going to have to deal with both inside of ourselves and outside of ourselves. Some are more mild forces and some are quite dark forces. So the mild forces I'll call temptation. And temptation is basically about things that promise pleasure now. It doesn't take into account long-term consequences, doesn't take into account whether it's healthy or whether it might hurt others. It's this thing will give you pleasure now. So it's an unhealthy thing that gives you pleasure now. So that's kind of the temptation. We all face them every day. It's part of our life. But when I talk about dark forces, I'm talking about something that's deeper. So let me give you an example and then I'll explain what's involved in it. If you can go back just a couple years to COVID, the first lockdown. So all of a sudden you're sitting at home, all alone, disconnected from all your normal connections with people and activities. For many of you, after sitting alone for a couple days, it's just like this dark force came alive inside of you. And this dark force had a power all of its own, and it wanted to pull you powerfully in a certain direction that was not healthy. It might have wanted to really pull you to act in a sexual direction, or food direction, or a self-harm direction, or even a relapse into addiction type direction. It was powerful. It was like there's something else inside of you, and a monster. And you knew that if you fed it, it was just like another person was going to come out of you. Somebody that, who wasn't you. And if you fed it, you would actually just make it stronger. So it wouldn't make the dark force go away. It would just make it darker, and it would take you to a darker and darker place. And so part of parenting ourself is dealing with temptations, but also dealing with dark forces. So let me just expand a little bit on what we mean when we talk about this dark force. It is a power that arises inside of us, and we'll kind of explain where it comes from in a bit, but it pulls us towards unhealthy. Now, temptation, the focus was instant gratification. Dark forces, yes, it could be instant gratification, but sometimes dark forces, you know you're not going to get instant gratification. It's just pulling you to do bad stuff. And you can't explain it, but it's there. And then it gets you to want to do something impulsive, rash, just act without thinking. With that dark force comes a set of lies 
distortions in our thinking. With that dark force can come what we refer to as intrusive thoughts. Dark thoughts that just pop into our heads. We didn't go looking for them. They're just there. And for some that can be self-harm, suicidal, hurt others, steal, all kinds of different things. Then there can be obsessive thoughts. You can't shake those dark thoughts. They just won't go away. You fight them, but they're still coming back over and over there again. So what it is trying to do is keep us in a limbic brain where we're going to act out of the limbic brain. And it is tough to deal with. It is really hard. It's a war. But we know if we give into it, we're feeding a monster. And it's just going to get worse. And things are only going to get darker. So that's what we are parenting, is forces outside of ourself that want to pull us towards unhealthy things and forces inside of ourself that want to pull us towards unhealthy. And so part of parenting ourself is learning tools to handle those forces. And that's what we're going to look at today. But I want to begin by just having you think a little bit about some about forces in the context of nature. So if you look at nature around us, there are forces. We have gravity. We have magnetism. Those forces are invisible forces. You can't see them, but they exert a power on you even though you can't see them. And if you don't respect them, you could get into big trouble. If you just say one day, well, I just don't care about gravity and I'm going to step off this building, <clears throat> you're going to be in big trouble. So the forces are unseen. The forces, if you don't respect them, can get you in trouble. But more than that, there are forces in nature that can be both good and bad. So think of the wind. You can have the force of the wind. You can't see it. But it can be soothing, it can cool you down, it can be refreshing, or you can have a hurricane, a tornado, a destructive force, or you can take currents in water. You can have a lovely stream with a gentle current that's soothing and refreshing, or you can have deep riptide currents, undertoes, strong deep river currents that pull you under and take your life. So some forces can be good, but that same force in a certain context can become destructive. So that's important to understand as we look at the forces that we're going to have to deal with. There's another thing I want you to think about when we think of forces, and that's just think about forces in your life. There are some forces that you cannot totally stop. They're what we would call inexorable. They just are going to pull you a certain direction. You might be able to slow them down a little bit, but they're going to win. And so that would be aging and death. So there are forces in life that age us and that are going to eventually result in us dying. We can't stop that. And so those, some forces we can't stop. But we're going to be looking at forces that we can stop. I'm just wanting to give you a context. Now I want you to think about forces that you can't see, but you feel in a culture. Every culture exerts forces on a person. So if you look at our Western culture... Every child growing up in our Western culture feels the force of the culture. So here's some of the things they feel. That to be successful, you have to look a certain way. You have to be beautiful by a certain definition. Or you have to have a certain 
a job, a certain amount of money in order to be considered successful. Some cultures exert a force when it comes to what you believe about God, about religion, about family, about patriotism. And what I want you to see is if you don't believe that stuff, if you don't submit to the force of that culture, then the culture says you're bad, a bad citizen. <clears throat> the culture says you're a failure. And the culture gives pushback and they could ostracize you. They could even persecute you. So there's a force that if you fight against it, it could get you into big trouble within that culture. There's another subtle force in cultures and not so subtle at times. And that would be around prejudice that certain people we view certain ways. We treat certain ways. Nobody necessarily has to say it in words, but everybody senses it. Children pick it up, and they develop attitudes towards different ethnicity groups, different skin colors, men, women, gay, straight. All of those things develop attitudes. And so culture exerts a force that we have to live in and navigate as people within that culture. Okay, having said all of that, let me go to the forces inside of ourselves. So some of the people would refer to them as their inner demons, their dark side. They're again, they're connected to the limbic brain. But a couple things I want you to see, they can, be a good force that can turn into a bad force. They can come out of complex trauma. We're going to look at that. They can give instant gratification or not, but they will always lead to a darker place if we give into it. And if we give into it, we feed a monster. So let me show you some of these dark forces. So let's start with a good force that can turn into a bad force. So if you take our 12 needs, what you have is we have a need for food. And so we have a built-in hunger if we don't have enough food. That's a good force. But what can happen for some people is that turns into a dark force. Now all they want is food, gluttony, eat, eat, eat. So that good force of hunger became a dark, destructive force. Second, we have a sex drive. That can be a very good force. It can lead to procreation. It can lead to beauty in a relationship. But that can turn into a dark force, lust. And it can become destructive in a person's life and ruin marriages and ruin lives. So, good force that became a dark force, and the more that dark force is fed, the harder it is to handle. And then we have a desire to get a job, to make money. That is a necessary good force, because that leads to being able to provide for ourselves, to have a certain amount of security. But that can turn into a dark force. Now I'd live for more money. Greed. And greed is a powerful destructive force. So you've got gluttony, lust, greed. All of those are good forces turned into dark forces. And then you can have a person who just has a healthy desire that I want to be in a position of influence so they get into a position of authority. But that good force of being an authority and, and that role can turn into a dark force. I just want power. I want to dominate people. And so they abuse authority and do great damage. And then there's a deep force that drives us to want justice. But that can turn into a dark force where we want revenge. We don't really care about healthy justice. We just want our pound of flesh revenge. 
Then you got a force that wants to make a difference in life, to have a sense of purpose and, and significance. But that can turn into a dark force where I'm driven to prove myself. I'm driven to accomplish, accomplish, to be the best at everything, walk all over people, and that can just dominate a person's life and destroy it. And then we have a force that needs to rest and relax. But that can turn into a dark force where now I don't want to do anything. I can't get motivated. I just am lethargic and lazy all the time and I can't break the power of that dark force. Good forces that can become bad forces. But then let's look at the dark forces that come out of complex trauma. And what I want you to understand is complex trauma creates more dark forces than anything else, in my estimation. And it does it in all kinds of ways. When a child's needs aren't met, when issues aren't resolved, when anger is not resolved, when depression is not resolved, when there is all kinds of violations of love, when all, it just goes on and on. And each one of those things can contribute to dark forces. So the first area I want you to look at is this. Complex trauma causes emotions to become dark forces. So an emotion, an intense, painful emotions design is to pull us to want to fix the situation so that the emotion is resolved and goes away. But when a child can't resolve that emotion because they can't fix the situation, what begins to happen is that emotion now pulls them towards fight, flight, freeze, fawn, destructive de behavior. It pulls them in a downward direction. In pulling them towards survival, it's setting them up to develop ways of coping that are going to become harmful in later life. So all of the emotions, both negative and even positive emotions, due to complex trauma, now aren't forces that pull you in a positive direction. They start to pull you in a dark direction. So they can trigger dark forces. So let me get you to think about that. If your anger gets triggered and you're super angry, it's like a dark force takes over. It pulls you to want to lash out, to want to hurt somebody back, to want to hurt yourself, to want to relapse, to not care. So when that painful emotion is triggered, it triggers a dark force. How about if your mental health gets triggered, depression and anxiety? For many, that triggers now a dark force. As soon as they're depressed, that just pulls them in a dark, dark direction. When they feel anxiety, that pulls them in a dark, dark direction. How about if your shame is triggered? You're made to feel not good enough. You're made to feel unlovable. You feel rejected. You feel abandoned. When abandonment gets triggered, wow, it can trigger a dark force that just pulls you to want to isolate, to want to harm yourself, to just want to end relationships, to want to hurt somebody. It can take you in a dark direction. There's just a force that takes over. Same is true as if you feel rejected, and that triggers a dark force. If you feel disrespected, that triggers a dark force. If you experience injustice, that can trigger a dark force. If you are in a time of chaos or drama, that can trigger a dark force. If you're going through a time of change or you're going through stuff where you're sitting in the unknown, you're not sure what's going to happen, that can trigger a dark force. So all of those things come out of complex trauma. And so now if those issues from complex trauma get triggered, it triggers a dark force. And it can be a very powerful dark force. So let me take that further. What can then happen for a lot of people is to not have a need met. One of the 12 needs met 
it can trigger dark forces today. So give me, let me give you an example. Let's say that you were never validated as a kid. You were criticized all the time, never praised because they're afraid to give you a big head. So you have a need for validation. And now because of never being validated, you have a force inside of you that wants validation. And so in every situation you're at, you just feel this force take over where you want to be the center of attention. You want people to notice you. Or you want to prove your value all the time. And you do it through activities, through externals. But there's a, you're, there's a drivenness that comes out of that. Or if you didn't get your connection, attachment needs met as a child. And that's a powerful need. That can create a hyper drive for connection. And it can become a dark force for you. You just want to connect. And it doesn't have to even be a healthy person. You just want to feel connected. And you'll connect with very unhealthy people that could lead to abuse and all kinds of problems. And you'll even connect to a chemical just to feel the feelings of connection. It takes over as a dark force. Then let's say your need to be nurtured and comforted and soothed was not met when you were a child. And so nobody gave you the tools to comfort and soothe yourself. So now you find drugs and alcohol and food and sex and gambling. And you find those have a soothing effect on you. They become a dark force in your life. Every time now you feel stressed or agitated or anxiety, you just run with this powerful drivenness to your self-soothing tools. They become this powerful dark force now, and it all comes out of complex trauma. So what I hope you see is that complex trauma, it just creates one dark force after another. And those dark forces somewhere live inside your brain, and they can get triggered today if your need isn't met if you get an old wound touched, if you have a powerful emotion activated, trigger, trigger of a dark force. So reparenting yourself from complex trauma is yes, dealing with some temptations that are just part of life, but it's dealing with this closet full of dark forces and there's many of them. And they can get triggered in many ways. Now I need to add a couple other types of forces that we have to deal with in recovery. First is family. So our family, it can be a wonderful thing that exerts good forces on us. They can be loving parents who are great role models, who set good boundaries, and that can put the right pressure, the right force on us to shape us to become healthy. But you can have a family that's unhealthy, that's toxic, and they're going to exert unhealthy pressure on you. That's going to make you unhealthy. And so for you to reparent yourself, you're going to have to resist the pressure of an unhealthy family because it's going to still try to exert that pressure on you. So let me give you a couple examples. Many unhealthy families, they have roles for their children. They want one child to be the comedian, one child to be the hero, one child to be the, serv- the servant, one child to be invisible. And the child feels a subtle pressure to fit that role within the family. Then some families, they have certain roles for men and women, mom and dad. And so they expect you to follow those roles as you grow up and fit the role for a woman or the role for a man. Families that are unhealthy, they define loyalty a certain way, which means that you never get the the family in trouble. You keep the family secrets. And that's what loyalty means, and that makes you sick. 
but you feel the pressure. You can't talk about stuff. You can't get help for stuff because that would be disloyal to your family. You can't say anything bad about your parents because that would be disloyal. And you feel that pressure all the time. And then there's the unspoken rules, but you feel the pressure on how certain family members are to be treated. Even though they might be very unhealthy, you have to let them away with it. You never confront them. You just make them feel better. And then there's unspoken values and beliefs that are in a family. And you pick up those things and you feel pressure to adopt their beliefs and values about people, about money, about things, about religion, whatever. And if you don't adopt that, then they exert even more pressure on you to get you to conform. So being part of a family that's healthy is wonderful because it's a good pressure that makes you healthy. Being part of a family that's toxic and unhealthy means you live with unhealthy pressure exerted on you all the time. And reparenting yourself means fighting that pressure. And then there's the pressure that can come from friends. And this again can be a good pressure or a bad pressure. And so peer pressure we refer to as negative pressure to do bad things put on us by friends. And it's, we feel the pressure because we want to be liked. We want to fit in. And so you can have friends that want you to act a certain way, adopt certain attitudes, dress a certain way, talk a certain way treat others a certain way, do certain activities, and you feel the pressure as soon as you're around them that you have to do what the group does and be like them in order to be accepted. And that's a strong pressure. And so part of recovery is learning to manage the pressure that comes from unhealthy friends. And that can be a challenge. Then... There's the pressure exerted by a religious organization. It doesn't matter what the religion is, religious organizations exert a pressure. And so <clears throat> within them, they have beliefs about what is acceptable behaviors and speech. So is it all right for them to drink alcohol, to get a tattoo, to get piercings, to go to a dance? All of those things are behaviors. Then they have beliefs about creation, about hell, about death, about gay versus straight, about the role of women, about politics, about sex, about God. All of those beliefs are there. And then they have an expectation about involvement in that religious organization and about finding your friends amongst the people of that religious organization. And you just walk into that organization and you feel that pressure. But what happens if that organization isn't healthy? What happens if that organization is actually spiritually abusive? So for you to walk into that, you're going to have to resist some of the pressures. And that's going to cause them to say, you're a bad Christian. You're going against God and they're going to ostracize you, they're going to put more pressure on you, they're going to condemn you, it's going to be very difficult. And so for some people in their recovery, in their spiritual journey, they need to be aware that they're probably going to face forces that come out of religious organizations. And those can be super hard to deal with because they claim that God is the one behind what they do. So you're fighting God, not just them. Then there's just the force of certain people. So we meet people and they, we go, wow, they just have a force of personality. <laughs> there's just a magnetism about them, a charisma about them that just draws people to them. They're kind of a, a natural leader. People just follow them. 
Those people can be great if they're healthy, but they can do a ton of damage if they're not. Cult leaders that have led many people into terrible situations have been those magnetic people. And so what you have to be prepared for in your recovery journey is you're going to meet magnetic people. And if they're not healthy, you've got to learn how to deal with the force that comes off of them so you don't get drawn into it. Then there's people who try to be a force in your life. And this can be good or bad. This is the person who wants to influence you and exert force on you. And so if it's a, a mentor or a coach, that can be a wonderful thing. You can get somebody that's a surrogate parent, a big brother, and they can be a wonderful exertion of good force on your life. But do you realize a sexual predator and tries to insert themselves into your life, groom you and exert pressure on you to abuse you? That's what a narcissist does too. They get into your, try to get into your life and they try to do all kinds of things so that you adore them. They act like they love you, but they're only using you. A salesperson, they act all sweet and wonderful, but they're just wanting you to buy something. They're wanting to exert a force on you so that you'll do what they want. And then politicians, religious leaders, they have an agenda. And they put themselves in their life and they want to exhort force so that you will go with their agenda. And so part of recovery is not just dealing with people with magnetic personalities. It's dealing with people who try to insert themselves in my life so that they can influence me to their agenda. And if they're not healthy, that will really mess me up. And so I need to learn how to handle that force in my life. So let me just talk about things that trigger these dark forces. So most of the time they're having a snooze. They're locked away in a closet. We're not even aware they're there. But then something happens that triggers them and they come awake and they come awake with power. So what are the triggers? So it can be just being alone not connected. So lack of connection can trigger dark forces. Be very aware of that. Any intense negative emotion wakes up the dark forces. Physical pain or being sick can trigger the dark forces. Struggling with your mental health can trigger your dark forces. So what I want you to see is you can have an emotional source, a mental health source, a physical source, relationship source, and then if your deepest complex trauma issues and wounds get triggered, that triggers a dark form. If you're in certain places, if you're with certain people, that can trigger dark forces. If you're just tired and exhausted, that can trigger a dark force. You're run down physically. But, flip side, it doesn't just have to be negative. Celebrations, anniversaries, great events can trigger dark forces. So all of those things trigger these things awake. So just so that you're aware of it. So let's come to tools for dealing with these dark forces. So number one, doubt, develop self-awareness. Become more aware of your dark forces, what yours are particularly, and what triggers them. Secondly, develop self-compassion. A lot of people, when they feel a dark force arising inside themselves, they think they failed, they get mad at themselves, they think they're a terrible person. No, you didn't ask those dark forces to come. It wasn't your idea. They just came unbidden from nowhere. So be kind to yourself. The issue isn't that the dark forces are arising. That doesn't make you a bad person. What would be the problem is if you gave into the dark forces. But just having them arise, 
That's just life. And it doesn't mean you have done anything wrong. So be compassionate to yourself. That is so important. Talk to somebody safe about your dark forces. It gets the secret of them out. And that often helps you deal with them better. Practice mindfulness. Become aware, not just when the dark forces are building, but become aware in the rest of your life of how am I doing overall in my mental health? How am I doing overall in my physical tiredness, my pain? Am I in a good head space? Dark forces come when I'm not in a good headspace. That's the bottom line. So be aware on an ongoing basis of what kind of headspace I'm in. And if I'm seeing I'm not in a great headspace, catch that and find out why and begin to go, okay, what do I need to change to get into a better headspace? So that growing ability of mindfulness is so important. If you get to a time where you're dark, you're triggered and the dark forces just rise up very quickly, some of you realize you don't have a lot of time and you're too weak to wrestle them by yourself. So in that small window, reach out to a friend right away. Say, whoa, something just happened and I am struggling like crazy with this dark force. I just need your support and somebody to talk to. Do not be afraid to do that. When you're going to events or around people that you know will probably trigger some stuff that could trigger dark forces, prepare yourself in advance. Just like the child going off to university or off to work at, at, in, in construction. You would say to the one going to university, there's a mindset in university. There's a lot of drinking in the first bit, a lot of pressure around that. You need to be aware of that. What are you going to do to be prepared for that? You're going off to a construction crew. There's a certain mindset usually in a construction crew. And this is the, what the temptation you're going to face. We need to be prepared for that. So prepare for things that you know could trigger dark forces. And then, like I said, connection. If we are going to fight dark forces, we have to stay connected to ourselves, to others, to our higher power. Again, realize dark forces are part of the limbic brain. And so do grounding that gets you out of the limbic brain into your cortex so that you're able to think things through truth-wise, not think through distortions of the limbic brain. But you need to deal with the limbic brain as well. And so you've got these dark desires that are growing in the limbic brain. Work to create more beautiful desires in your limbic brain. Focus your attention on beauty, on things that will cause you to desire beautiful things, the right things, and pull you towards healthy and overpower the dark forces and their pull. So big picture from that is in the moment you're feeding your limbic brain stuff that makes it want beauty. In the rest of your life, outside of when you're triggered, make sure you're feeding your soul good stuff. Because dark forces can take root and grow easily in a soul that hasn't been fed. In a soul that's been fed junk. So feed your soul good stuff. Final thing. Be aware of how strong you are to resist the magnetic pull of certain people in certain cultures. And if you're not strong enough to resist the magnetic pull, you'll need a boundary to say, I just can't go around those people. So let's say you've been in recovery, you're growing stronger, you're doing well, but you know if you go spend time with your toxic family on the weekend, as soon as you get around their magnetic pole, you won't be able to resist it. And all of a sudden you're going to be back into the old way of thinking, 
doing stuff that they want to do that you know is going to hurt you and you just can't resist that pull. Or if an old friend calls you up and, and you know they have a powerful force on your life and you know I can't resist that force if I'm around them, they're going to suggest we do this and I won't be able to say no, say no now. Set boundaries. Now, hopefully in time as you get stronger, you'll be able to go around your family and resist the magnetic pull of your family. But recognize that if you're not there yet, that's okay. Just set boundaries and keep working on yourself until you get stronger. So that's the end of part one. That's dealing with these dark forces within us and without us. And I hope that just helps you, gives you greater awareness and some tools. We're going to take a short break and then come back for the Christian part. If that's not of interest to you, no problem at all. No offense taken. Just glad you could be here for the first part. We'll see you next week. For everybody else, we'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We're looking at the Psalms, the prayer book and hymn book, the song book of the Jewish people. And I just love this because what it does is it shows us two things. It shows us what a relationship with God looks like. It's an honest, authentic relationship. It's able to express emotions and struggles. And it shows us what healthy spiritual people look like. They're honest about their struggles. And so what happens in these psalms is the people begin by talking about their pain and their struggles. And most of the psalms begin that way. But there's a movement and they begin to process that and work through it and come to a point at the end of the psalm where they're able to resolve it and trust and surrender. So they start in their limbic brain and they move to their cortex. And so today I want to talk about a person who is writing because they're deeply lonely. They're struggling. And many of you, I'm, I'm talking about this because many of you can relate to that. You have, are finding in your recovery that you've lost a lot of your old friends, you've had to set boundaries with your family, you haven't been able to make a lot of good new friends yet, and just the loneliness is killing you. So I just want you to really hear how this guy talks to God about it, how he expresses it, and it might put words to what you're feeling, and it might help validate that it's okay to be going through the feelings that you're going through, but then I hope it helps you shift towards being able to come to resolve it. So Psalm 102, and it says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea. Don't turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. For my days disappear like smoke. My bones burn like red hot coals. So I'm in physical pain. My heart is sick, withered like grass. I've lost my appetite. So he's depressed. Because of my groaning, I'm reduced to skin and bones. I can't even eat. Then he says this, I am like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. Wow, does that ever capture the feeling of loneliness? A little owl in a far-off desert. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on the roof. Do you capture the emotions there? Like an owl in a desert, all alone, no hope of anybody being around. There's an emptiness, there's a sadness, there's a, an overwhelming longing, there's an anxiety, will I ever find anybody? There's physical pain, there's a dull emotional ache that's just part of this. There's a depression. 
Like it's just loneliness is all kinds of different painful emotions blended together. And he captures it in this owl in a desert. And that's how many of you feel, that owl in a desert. And so there's a fear, feeling of abandonment, a feeling of not being wanted. There's a fear that I will be this way forever. Nobody will ever want me. There's a fear that maybe it's me and I'm not lovable. Awful, awful emotions. And that's what the writer is saying. And you can tell it's getting to him. It's keeping him awake at night. He can't eat. He's in physical pain. It's messing him up how awful all of this is. And then he goes further. He says, my enemies taunt me day after day. They mock and curse me. I eat ashes for food. My tears run down into my drink. And this part then is interesting to me because in his limbic brain, he feels that this must be God's judgment on my life. It's not, but that's what his limbic brain is feeling. God's mad at me. That's why these things are happening. So you have picked me up and thrown me out. So his distorted thinking is, comes into play now, and he's expressing that. Then my life passes as swiftly as evening shadows. In other words, probably going to be lonely until I die, and that's going to happen soon. It's never going to happen. I'm withering away like grass. My he, God broke my strength in midlife, cutting short my days. I'm mad at God now because I can't get a friend. So you can just see him spinning here, thinking God's mad at him, mad at God, thinking his life is over, jumping to the worst case scenario. I'm probably going to just die. He's in a dark place, but he's putting it into words. And that is the beauty of this. He's being honest about what he's actually feeling. But then we start to see the shift happen. And this is the important thing. So he's moving out of the limbic brain. Now he's getting into the cortex and he says, But I cried to him, O oh Lord, or O oh my God, who lives forever, don't take my life while I'm so young. Long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. But you are always the same. You will live forever. Get the theme? He's talking about everything changes except you, God. Everything dies except you, God. The children of young people will live in security. Their children's children will thrive in your presence. Now, this is significant. He goes, if I'm looking to people only to satisfy my loneliness, I am going to be disappointed. Because people change. People die. People exit my life. So, yes, it hurts to not have a human friend right now, but that doesn't mean I cannot have a friend. Because there is someone who never changes and never dies. And so they will never abandon me. They will always be there. They will always be able to be relied on. And that's God. So the answer to my loneliness right now is to go to this God that never changes or never will die. And that's what he does. And then he comes back to hope. And what the psalmist is showing us is this. When we have deep, deep loneliness, yes, express it, but find your first and greatest friendship in your higher power. That becomes the friend that will never leave you or forsake you, and so you will never truly be lonely if you have that relationship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, <coughs> thank you for this psalm. Thank you for the truth that comes out of this psalm. Thank you that you are the perfect friend. And just help us grow in our relationship with you. Help us to stay connected to you. And help others who are seeking to get to know you to do that. Just give them the help they need in that journey, I pray. 
Amen. Well, thank you again for being with us. Hopefully it's been helpful for you tonight.